When I was a teenager, when I was in junior high, I don't know what my school people were thinking, but they put me in charge of the, the uh, concession stand for the junior high basketball games. <laughs> All that popcorn. <laughs> and Snickers and peanut M&Ms <laughs> and blow pops and, and pickles in a pouch. I, you may not be excited, but you don't understand. Back in those days, we didn't have much money. We certainly couldn't splurge on things like eating. You know, <clears throat> I, <laughs> I was so excited. I didn't know anything about business whatsoever. I, I had never been in a business format, but I learned real quick about inventory reduction. Because I was eating it all, boy. You say, you pastor, you should have known better. Well, I... I kind of knew better, but my belly said different, you know. I had never been so happy in all my life. My dentist was happy, you know, all, eating all that candy. And, and I had become the most popular guy in all of Havenview Junior High. Because during the basketball games, all my friends was coming up to the counter. Can you give me something? Give me something. I was slipping stuff over the counter stuff. I know it was wrong. I know it was wrong. But at least, like I said, I had a little excuse. I didn't, I'd never been there before. I didn't even know Jesus at the time. I don't know what excuse my coach Cooley had. Now he, he was grown. I mean, he was real grown. He was like six foot five, 280 pounds. He was my baseball coach. And he would come knocking on the back door before we opened up every day in the concession stand. Sheffield, give me some popcorn. I'd hand him some popcorn, and I'd reach a hand out for payment, and he'd slap and say, thank you, Sheffield, and walk off. I mean, every day, it got to be where he was eating more than I was. And I'm like, no, this can't happen. So I got up to nerve, you know. I was going to tell him. I was going to stand up to this big old bully. And you know, that was a big deal because, you know, I, I was real scared. I wasn't this big back then. I looked like a broomstick in a pair of parachute pants or something. I mean, I was, I was like a buck 50, you know, six foot one or something. And he came in there, and I was going to stand up to him, and I kind of, I kind of turned my back and mumbled under my breath, uh, uh, Coach, you're going to have to pay for that. And when I said that, he walked up in the concession stand and shut the door behind him. The thing was still shut, you know, nobody could see. I started sweating. He was already sweating. He just like, he sweat all the time. And he came over there. He just grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and put me up on the wall. And his eyes was bugging. And his breath was really nasty, and I, my face felt like it was melting. I was like, ah! I was, I was like, just hit me and kill me. <laughs> Don't breathe on me no more, you know? But he said, Sheffield, you don't want me to tell on all. I've been seeing all the food you've been giving away. You better not say nothing about what I get. You understand? I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> He set me down. He reached over and grabbed a whole handful of blow pops and stuffed them in his gym shorts and walked out. He turned around and said, thank you, Sheffield. I was so mad. I couldn't believe it. You know what I did? I'll tell you later. <laughs> the things we get ourselves into before we know Christ. But now the Lord is my shepherd. And I'm eating good in the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down beside green pastures. Leadeth me. He leadeth me. Say, leadeth me. The Lord is leading me now. Beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness. That means right ways. He's leading me in the right way. I'm not stealing no more. For his name's sake. See, he's got a vested interest in me and in you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I don't care if he's six foot five and 280 pounds. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen? How many can say that? That he's my Lord. Are you experiencing green pastures and still waters? 
it's hard to have still waters t- these days, isn't it? When everything's going so fast. But uh, you, the presence of the Lord, he puts you in position to, to have the comfort of knowing that God is with you. Oh, there's no position like that. And that's what we're going to talk about today is being in position. Say in position. In position. Not in position. I in. In position. In position. That's the title of today's message, in position. Do you have a, a view from the upper room? Where are you seeing life from? You see, many people saw Jesus hanging on the cross. They saw him say, it is finished. They saw him stick the spear in his side and the blood come running out, his last drop. They saw him dangling there. They saw him pulled off the cross. Oh, he's gone. It ain't no question about it. They put him in a tomb for three days. They knew why do, you, why do you think when he came back and, and, and talked to the disciples and Thomas wasn't there? You remember Th- Thomas? He wasn't there when Jesus appeared after he raised from the dead. Why do you think Thomas said, I won't believe it? Because he saw him die. He knew he was gone. He knew he was dead. There wasn't no question about it. Oh, I'm not believing that. <laughs> I'd have to put my fingers in the holes in his hand. There ain't no way. I I know all of you say that, but I'm not believing it because I know what I know. He showed himself on that first day to Mary Magdalene, some other lady, another Mary. He chased down those two on the road to Emmaus, you remember? Then he appeared to all the disciples minus Thomas that afternoon. Then he came back and appeared to Thomas. And corrected Thomas. And then what did Thomas see when he saw him alive again? He said, my Lord, my God. Because you know what? Somebody that says they're going in the tomb, but I'm getting back up. And they do it. I'm going to listen to what they have to say from then on. He is whoever this guy is. He is who he says he is. Because he does what he says he's going to do. In a way that nobody else could do it. And they saw him. And then what gets me is in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verse 5. It says he was seen by Peter in the 12. But after that, he was seen by more than 500 followers at the same, at one time. He showed himself openly to people. Over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. And that was just at one time. How many other smaller meetings did we have? We don't know. It's not recorded for us. But we know at least 500 that saw him die on that cross have now seen him resurrected. And they should feel the same way as Thomas. My Lord, my God. And I know that you believe in the resurrected Christ. I know you say, my Lord, my God. But I want to ask you a question today. Why were only 120 in position where Jesus told them to go after he was resurrected when over 500 saw him alive just a few days later? Where are the other 380? Out of the 500, let's just say, round it off to 500. They saw him alive. They believed in him. They were his followers. And he put them, he told them to go to Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The day of Pentecost. But there was only 120 in the upper room. Where were the other 380? I don't know if those percentages are right, but it probably seems about right. In the church today, we got 380 professing that he's Lord. But only maybe 120 that's in position. To stay in position. To receive from God. The power that God wanted them to have. He said don't leave home without it. Go and wait. Be where I told you to be. Where were the 380? I'm sure they had excuses. I'm sure they had good excuses. Oh, I got family thing. 
I've got a job. My, my aunt's getting married. I'm always picking on the aunt, right? You know, my cousin's coming over. They had good excuses, I'm sure. But let me tell you, there's a difference between good and God. There's a difference between doing good things and being where God called you to be. And if you want to have a, a view from the upper room, now I'm talking about the upper, upper room, where it says we're seated in Christ in heavenly places. Far above all power and principality and rulers of the darkness. I'm talking about to, to see from way up there. If you want to have a view that God wants you to have in this life beside those still waters and those green pastures, then you're going to have to be in position. Live your life in position. Reminds me of that story I think I told a couple weeks ago about the wedding feast. Remember the parable of the wedding feast? Jesus said the, the king was throwing a big party for his son who was getting married, a wedding feast. And he killed the fatted calf and the, all his prized animals. And he had everything ready, you see. And then he said, go tell all the people I invited to come. But without fail, they all make excuse. They live in an excuse field. What I want to encourage you today is don't live in an excuse field. Because he said those that I invited didn't come. They aren't worthy of what I've done for them. You see what I'm saying? He had to go into the, he said go into the byways and the highways and the hedges. Go into the crack alleys. You know, I was the house band at Cane Creek Nightclub in the Ark of Butler, Mississippi when he came and got me. You listen to what I'm saying? He said, go, go in the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. And maybe some of you were called in some not so lovely places, but at least you're in position today. And I want to encourage you to stay in position. Don't be moved off of your position. Because the Bible also, he tells a story about the ten virgins. He said five of them were wise. They kept oil in their lamps and oil is symbolic of the Holy Ghost. They stayed filled with the Holy Spirit. They kept their lights trimmed. That means they was walking in light. But five virgins that were supposed to meet the bridegroom, they let their lights go out and they let their oil run dry. And then when he came and the bridegroom came, they were locked out. I think that's a picture of the rapture. I don't know. But I believe Jesus is coming back for his church. He's going to take us out before the wrath of God is poured out on this earth during the tribulation period, seven years. And I don't want to be here for that. And you don't either. And God don't want you here. But I wonder, is these five foolish virgins, why they weren't let in. And I wonder how many of us are in position to go when Jesus says, come up hither. In Luke 18, 8, it says, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? So he's returning. But you've got to be in a position of faith. Will he find you in a position of faith? Are you in, you out? We don't even know where they went. They didn't show up. The 120 had faith to be where Jesus positioned them. Five of the virgins stayed filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know what happened to the 380. I don't mean, that don't mean they lost. I mean, maybe they go to heaven, they're his followers. But they're not in position to do like Joe said. You know, to... to to leave your seed planted, you got to be in position. The devil wants to position us, that's for sure. He's got a plan for our life. He wants us so busy making sure that my will be done on the earth. Isn't that it? Oh, he'll tell you how important your happiness is. He'll tell you how important your will be done on the earth is. 
He wants us throwing up sloppy lives like houses with no foundations. And we know what happens when the wind and the wave beat upon them. He wants us positioning our lives on the shifting wide paths of modern culture. So I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> I'm going to ask it twice so it will sink in. What is your position on issues that God has already addressed, but society is challenging? I think it's ringing with some of you. Let me say it again. What is your position on issues that God has already addressed in his word? But society is challenging because, you know, society, it's moving all the time. It's, it's fluid, but the word of God is solid. What is your position on abortion? What is your position on homosexuality? What is your position on divorce? What is your position on family? What is your position on God made them male and female? These are things that's already been addressed. And I want to ask you, has culture worn you down? Has culture bullied you into agreeing with them because they're, they're louder voices than the church? A professor at a medical college recently apologized to her woke students for implying that only women can have babies. True. She apologized for saying that only women can have babies. I saw a video of a man trying to breastfeed a woman, a, a baby. A man trying to breastfeed a baby and couldn't understand why it didn't work. If we go along with this lunacy, guess who's going to suffer? Our children. There was another video I saw of, I think it was San Francisco Gay Choir or something. They got a song out called, We're Coming for Your Children. I'm not making this up. They're out of the closet on that, so to speak. They're indoctrinating our children. You wonder why so many young Americans hate America now? Because they're being indoctrinated. They're coming for your children. UCSF's Diane Efrensaf, one of the leading proponents of socially transitioning transgender children. That's her title. Let me say that again. Socially transitioning transgender children. Is there such a thing as transgender children? She believes that there's no minimum age really to pursue a change. We have seen some kids as young as two whose parents are bringing them in because they begin to say, me not boy, me girl. Social transitioning can happen as soon as a child has language or the ability to communicate to us who they are. I can tell you who they are. They're children of God that need direction. So they begin to put them on hormone therapy. Kids. Puberty blockers. So they can eventually have gender reassignment surgery. I don't have to have a PhD in anything to tell you that is just wrong. That is just wrong. You can disagree with me. I know that this stuff has infiltrated the church. We have been bullied. We have been worn down. We have in the name of loving everybody and, and believing that, you know, uh, le just let them love who they want to love. Well, love speaks the truth that I see in my word. If you go along with this, you're not in position 
that God would have you to be in. We love everybody. Now, I'm not transgender, homosexual. We love you, but we love you enough to tell you the truth. That's not God's plan for your life. You are confused. Now, you can get mad at me if you want. You can say, I'm not going to that church, but that's on you. Because you're going to have to explain your position to God. I'm staying with the Word of God, and this church is staying with the Word of God. Say amen if you want to or on me. But you're going to have to answer for your positions that you agree with on the world instead of the, the Word. Of the end times, Matthew 24, 12, Jesus said sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures till the end shall be saved. It'd be nice if we could pick and choose what we want to believe out of the Word of God. But we can't. So what's the position that works? Well, on your knees praying would be a good place to start. With your hands lifted in praise, that's a good position. Maybe sitting down with the Bible in your lap. That's the position of a Christian. Staying hooked up to the truth. In Psalms 91 verse 4. It says those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You are supposed to spend your life in the shadow of God Almighty. And let me tell you, there's no darkness in that shadow because there's no darkness in Him at all. It's glory under the shadow of the Almighty. Are you listening to me? You walk with God, you will have shelter. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. And I trust in Him. You see, I trust in Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every, every deadly disease. Yes. Yes. So is the safe place at home during a pandemic? Well, I can't get to the church fast enough. He is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He protects me from a deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. I'm going to stay in the word. I'm going to stay in faith because faith is the position that pleases God. Besides, we have to stay close enough so that we can hear his still small voice, right? When he guides us, Isaiah 30, 21 says, Your own ears, you will hear him. Right behind you. See, he's right with you. A voice will say, this is the way that you should go. Whether to the right or to the left. See, God is positioning you. The GPS, the God positioning system. His voice in your heart saying, go to the right a little bit. Whoa, a little bit more right. Oh, that's dangerous. Go way right. His word is a lamp unto our path. It keeps us from walking in the darkness of this world. Now, if you, if, you, if you disagree with anything I've said today, that's your right, okay? We still love you. That ain't going to change anything between us. But I'm just trying to help you see that we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. And we need to agree with him. When we're positioned in his presence... Under the shadow of the Almighty, you partake of His power, His protection, and His provision. That's where you partake. His power, His protection, and His provision. Right here at the church, man, we offer all those kind of positions. How many times have you been to a Sunday service? Or a life group, or maybe an outreach or something? And you leave thinking, wow, I am changed forever. I am so glad I didn't miss it. I almost slept in and missed that. Right? Life changing happens in the presence of God. You know, what if the woman with the issue of blood had not got in position? She'd still be bleeding. <laughs> But she, she fought her way through the crowd. She crawled. She scratched. She made her way. And she said, but if I could but touch the hem of his garment. If I can get in position. And she grabbed his robe. 
And the power and the provision and the protection came out. He said, I felt it. Somebody touched me. Somebody got in position. You know, Zacchaeus would still be we if he wouldn't have climbed that sycamore tree. But he got in position and Jesus noticed him. Somebody has got in position to get my attention. And he came over and he said, come on down. You're going to be with me today. We're going to your house. He wants to be with you. If you'll put yourself in position. I think about the prophet Elijah. He was a man that he would be put in tough positions. But he wasn't scared. He ain't scared. God told Elijah, I want you to go to the king and tell him it ain't going to rain for close to three years. Is that something you really want to do? You know this king? He kills people on a whim. He'll kill, kill you just because your hair ain't straight today. And you want me to go tell him he ain't going to have rain for three years? But Elijah went and he told him. And I guess the king, before he got the decree out to get him killed... Elijah snuck off and God said, I want you to, I'm going to position you. Don't worry, Elijah. You do my will, I'll position you. I'm going to put you by the brook Cherif. And you're going to drink from that clear spring water. And you know what? When you get hungry, I'm going to have the birds come and bring you some meat. The birds going to drop a ribeye off on you, Elijah. Fresh loaf of break bread. And he ate. And he drank and he sat by in position until God called him. Then, then the, the, uh, because of the three years of drought, the Cherif Brook finally dried up. God said, that's all right. I got another place. I want you to go to Zarephath. Plus, there's a little widow woman and her child I want you to save. So he went to Zarephath. Stayed in position. He didn't just, well, he didn't say, oh, this Cherif Brook has been good to me. I'm just going to sit here and wait for some more water. I don't want to leave this good position. Some, some of us, get, we get stuck in the old. And we don't understand God's always bringing fresh bread. Amen. We can't be in love with the process that God uses. Because he's always going to keep us moving forward. So he sent him to Zarephath. He got to Zarephath. And the, the drought had caused a famine. And he told this woman, go get me a drink of water and maybe a little piece of bread. And she says... I'm just going to be honest with you. We ain't got enough but to feed me and my boy. We're just going to eat our last meal to die tonight and die. He said, you just, you just listen to me. You go do what I said. Bring me a little piece. And she had faith. And she did what he, the prophet said. And from then on, her oil didn't run out. And her provision didn't run out. Her protection didn't run out. Later her child died and Elijah laid on the kid, got in position, and he rose him from the dead. There ain't nothing God won't do for you. If you're in position, you understand. So God said, Elijah, go back to the king and tell him it's about to rain. Most of us be like, well, I went that one time. It was close. But now I go back. I know he's hunting for my head now. But he had faith. God says, do it. Do it. He went back. He told the king. In fact, he, did, he didn't got such a man of faith now. He's he walking around like Layla coming down the, the aisle this morning. <laughs> like she's on a runway. Got her hair all fixed up, you know. <laughs> Elijah come, come walking into the king, looked like George Jefferson. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can live your life like George Jefferson if you, you stay in faith. He walked up in there and he, he not only told the king it was fixed to rain and all that, he, he looked around and he saw what was happening in society. He said, y'all are being led by these prophets of Baal and by these prophets of Asherah, these false gods. The thing, same things, the same spirits that's behind what we're facing today. These things I'm trying to tell you. The Israelites were being dumbed down. They were following an evil king who was following evil prophets. And they were losing sight of the word of God. And Elijah said, let's have a showdown. 
Let's see who really is God. You take them prophets and meet me up on the, on the mountaintop and we'll see who answers by fire. And then prophets of Baal and then prophets of Asherah, they begin to wail and make a big scene just like they do on CNN and all these other shows. They begin to call on their false god. They begin to cut themselves and mark themselves up and do all this stuff that they're doing today. Nothing. was no power in it. Elijah just laughed at him. He built a little old stone altar. He said, let's pour some water on it. This will make it interesting. Let me show you what my God, my God answered by fire. That whole nation was changed. They chased them prophets down to the river and killed all of them. He said, we're not following that no more. Our God will answer by fire if his people will stay in position. Position yourself. Another thing Elijah said up on that mountaintop. He addressed the people of Israel. And I'm addressing the body of Christ today. How long will you hobble between two opinions? If Baal is God's, then serve him. But if the Lord God is God, serve him. Make up your mind. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're about to close. Ooh. If you love the Lord, say amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for revelation. Thank you, Lord, for a fresh fire burning. Fresh fire in these bones. Shut up in these bones of every person in this building today. Every person online, every person hearing the sound of my voice, a fresh fire shut up in these bones. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We already turned there once. And Joe, I thought he was going to use my scripture. But I'm going to verse 1. It says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. So I went down to the river with a loaf of wonder bread and I threw it in. I took off walking down the river and I found it after many days and guess what? It was all soggy. I didn't even want to eat it. I'm just kidding. I did not do that. But what does this scripture mean? I mean, if you threw your bread on the water, I mean, what does this mean? I've heard different interpretations. Somebody says, you know, if you, if you put your grain on a boat and send it out across the waters and sell it afar and it, it'll come back to you, you know, cast your bread upon the water. I've heard different things. One of the interpretations that I kind of agree with, it says that when, say, a community was moving or like discoverers, you know, they were uh, in discovering a new land, they would throw grain into the river and though they were camping here for a while and moving at a slower pace, by the time they would get down river, crops would have grown and, and there was already wheat that had grown along the riverbanks and there was provision along the path. Whatever you believe about this scripture, I believe what we're getting at is there's be provision along the path if you cast your bread upon the water. But what did Jesus say was the bread of life? The word of God. And I think spiritually, if you look at this passage, God is saying, if you cast your bread upon the water, if you speak out the word of God, the promises of God in your life, you keep that planted like Joe said, then you'll find it after many days. What you speak, what the seeds you're putting out of your mouth is going to come back to you and you'll find it. After many days. So speak the word of God. Stop saying what the world wants you to say. I know they're very convincing. But the word of God is the truth. And the word of God will produce. Some people... They think, well, 
you know, people been saying that for years. And God's not coming back. And I don't know why y'all believe all that stuff. They just, the word of God seems like foolishness to them. You know, the angel of the Lord and a couple other angels went to uh, Sodom, to Lot. The people of Sodom tried to have sex with the angels. That's how corrupt, the perverse that this generation had become. And the angel of the Lord says, we're fixing to rain fire and brimstone down on this place. We're not allowing this abomination to continue. And so he told Lot, Lot, if you got any family members, go tell them to get in the house because we're about to leave. We're gonna, I'm going to get you out of here. Sort of like the rapture. You escape the wrath of God, right? And so Lot went to his daughter's boyfriends or their fiancés, his sons-in-law. And he told him that the angel of the Lord is here and he's about to save us from the wrath of God. We need to go. Come quickly. And the Bible says they thought he was joking. <laughs> oh, man, they've been saying that for years, man. They're fooling you. That preacher, the preacher down the street says that stuff. We don't listen to him. We not. What's wrong with you, Lot? I thought you was one of us. See, Lot must have been a little compromised himself. They thought, Lot, Lot, who are you to tell us anything, Lot? Is that, the way you, is that the influence that you want to have in the kingdom of God? To be so compromised that your word means nothing? They wouldn't come. Lot got back to the house, and, and the angel of the Lord says, come on, let's go. And even Lot was like, well, can we wait a little while? And maybe you're there, you're saying, maybe we can wait a little while. Maybe this doesn't happen right now. Maybe, maybe I get all that I want out of this life. I'm kind of enjoying it down here in Sodom. It's not that bad. Let me do for a little while, and then you come back, and then you can destroy it. And that's the mentality of some Christians. But the mercy of God caused the angel of the Lord to grab Lot and say, you've got to go now. And he pulled him out of the house to safety. And then fire and brimstone destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is judgment coming. Especially when you begin to mess with God's children. I'm talking about the little ones. There's a pattern of judgment that comes upon the earth when people begin to mess with God's children. And Lot's wife, she even looked back after that. See, we got to stay in position. It's so easy to begin to drift. you got to work hard to stay in position. Psalms 32, 8 says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Do you believe that? Well, then let him guide. He said, I will advise you. I will watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or a mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Is that the way you, you live your life? God's saying, all right, come back over here. He's always, you're having to live from miracle to miracle. God is having to save you all the time. He's having to grab you by the wrist and make you do right. I better quit. So I was so mad that day Coach Cooley stole my stuff. Still... Can you imagine that man stealing from the concession stand? Somebody had to pay for that stuff. I was indignant. I wanted to, you know what I did? I didn't do nothing. You know why? Because I weren't in position to do anything. Because I was just like him. And if you're hanging out with big ugly galoots, with nasty breath, you're going to be a big, ugly galoot with nasty breath. And there's always going to be some big, ugly galoot with nasty breath that's going to be bigger and stronger than you. And you ain't going to be able to say it. He's going to bully you around. You know who the biggest ugly galoot is? It's the devil himself. He's going to bully you. He's going to push you around. And your only defense is the armor of God. 
stay in the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Is the Lord your shepherd? You know what he does? That Why that rod and staff comforts you? Because when you're wandering off, he'll take that little hook and pull you back. He'll fight off the beast with that rod that's trying to kill you. Do you understand the, the devil's roars? He, 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 he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if you're not, if you get out of position with God, and then we go blaming God. God, this thing happened to me or whatever. Well, God's like, I ain't seen you in three weeks. Where you been? You got out of position. Okay, so we want him to be our shepherd. If we walk with the shepherd, in Psalms 23, 5, it says, he will prepare, prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. This is an ugly place down here. This is the valley of the shadow of death. And we got enemies everywhere. But God wants you to stay at the table. He wants you to be at the table. He wants to anoint your head with oil till it runs over. And surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's God's plan for your life. Are you positioned at a seat at the table? One last thing I was thinking about before I came here this morning. I was watching the Olympics. And uh, they was having the 800 meter relay. And the American was a heavy favorite to win. And it's just like two laps around the track. And the the American, it, on the first lap, somebody got tripped and fell, you know, and, uh, and that's what happens. Uh, you you, you got, got to be in position running this race. It's a whole bunch of grown men running as fast as they can for two laps, you know, and you got to be in the right position. And the American got trapped behind two or three guys in front of him, and he, he couldn't go way out here because he couldn't stay up. But he, he had to find a way, but he couldn't do it and find himself tripped up, right, and lose the whole race. And it looked, he was nervous. And after the race, they asked him, they said, man, that was, looked, looked mighty perilous coming around that last corner. He said, yes, sir. He said, I just prayed for an opening. And you know what he did? He went through that opening. And he took the lead and he finished his race. And God will make a way where there is no way. You'll never get tripped up as long as you're following the Lord. Amen. Does anybody in here question God's love for you? Because yesterday I was preaching and those kids, a lot of them didn't know, you know? And I hope you don't think I'm questioning your love for God. I want you to get in position. I don't want you to miss what God has for your life. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know God loves you. You don't know that the reason he was on that cross, he was in your position. Isn't that right? That was supposed to be my position. He took my position. He took my position as a lowly, no good, low life, big ugly galoot with bad breath. He took my position. All my sin was poured upon his shoulders. And he suffered the wrath of God so I could go in the rapture. So I don't have to be down here when the wrath of God is poured out. I don't have to go to the great white throne of judgment and be condemned to hell forever. He took my sin. He who knew no sin became sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God. Walking in the right ways of God. In the right position of God. And when I found that out, man, that's when my life changed. And I've been trying my best to stay in position as close as I can with Jesus every day since then. And I want you to have that opportunity today. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you want to right now, would you raise your hand? It's wherever you are. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you want to say, yeah, you be in charge, God. What about online? Anybody online? Just raise your hand. as a, Maybe raise both hands as a sign of surrender. Come, come on, somebody... We need to raise our hands and surrender to God. We do. Afresh, all the time. We don't be, need to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation to those who believe. 
You have the words of eternal life. Let your life so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your life count. Lift your hands to Jesus and say, I surrender afresh today, God. And if this is your first time, pray out loud like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and save me. Resurrect me from the dead just like you resurrected yourself. I will follow you all my days. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and keep me in position for power, for provision, and for your protection. And help me be a blessing to your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.